Do you go by Jack or do you go by Tom or what do you go by? I go by Jack. Jack. Okay, Jack. Well, tell me, uh, I was reading a little bit about your background with the ulcerative colitis and stuff. And that's, uh, I think that's a, you know, you're not alone in this situation with people using a, a dietary approach. So tell us, uh, give us a little background story if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. So four years ago, um, I was graduating, or I first started my freshman year of college and I struggled a lot with the independence, just drinking a lot, sort of partaking in activities that a lot of teens partake in when you're in college. And I never did that stuff. Not at all. Not, not, I'm, I'm kidding, man. I, was, <laughs> I spent half of my college years probably drunk, but not maybe not quite half. I still got good grades. Anyway, go ahead. Sorry. I understand, though. But yeah, so I came out of school, and my parents weren't so happy. My GPA wasn't very good, and I was going to transfer schools. And then on top of that, I found out that, like, well, during that college experience, I was pooping, blood, all my stools had blood, and I was just sort of, I didn't really care, I didn't really think anything of it, I don't know why I was like that, sort of, I don't know, I feel like there's something to do with the gut, brain connection, just something wasn't 100% right, but, so that summer, I got diagnosed, went to a gastroenterologist, got a colonoscopy, and they confirmed that I had ulcerative colitis, and basically the doctor gives you the spiel about how you're going to be on meds for the rest of your life, you're never going to be able to heal it like through diet. Diet has nothing to do with it at all. And um, that's when I started doing research and found doctors like you and Dr. Paul Saladino and just started giving like different diet approaches a try. And so it took me a few different times to find remission because originally I started out doing like a keto diet before I found you and Dr. Saladino. So like I was eating lots of nuts and that kept on holding me back week after week because with people with IBD, like especially with Crohn's and colitis, Fiber seems to be a main culprit that irritates people's colons, just all that bulk, putting pressure on the intestines definitely causes strain along with other factors, of course, too. But once I finally stumbled across your research, it took about a year to find, um, I gave the carnivore diet a try and just basically had steak, eggs and butter, still was on coffee, but it was like a carnivore diet for like a month and then found remission really quick. And then from there, pretty much, uh, like 90% animal based and then 10% like non-toxic plants, but carnivore diet definitely changed my life. Like it's a no brainer that saturated fat is super healthy and essential to the human diet. And it's like contrary to what we believe in what's in the media and modern day medicine. Well, I mean, no doubt, uh, you know, like I said, I, I, I'm cautious to extrapolate this to entire population, but certainly in your case, you can say that this has been very helpful for you. And, you know, it's saturated fats are very, they're not just one thing. There are there are many many different saturated fats out there that that you know people sort of don't sort of realize that the different saturated fats may act differently. But did, did you did you say you you did you end up going on biologics or any kind of medications with this? Um. Yes, I think it was called sulfasalazine. Well, sulfasalazine. Yeah. 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 So I took that for a while, um, probably for about two weeks and then I started developing like another issue like this swollen like lymph node or something I think that's what they call it, like under my chin so it's just like taking that resulted in another issue and then like we went to the doctor again to address that and they're like okay let's get you on another medication and then after hearing that I'm just like I can't keep doing this like this is going to be a bad cycle to get into and a lot of people get in that cycle and it's it's unfortunate and, you know i think the physicians are just as frustrated as the patient because they don't know what to do and they just say well let's try another try another drug at it yeah sulfasalazine is one of the older drugs some of the newer uh, immune system modulating drugs that are being used the tumor tumor necrosis or factor suppressing drugs the uh, you know the different uh, ones that are out there the humiras and, and and that type of stuff which are very one of them i think it's one of the most profitable drug in history now if i'm not mistaken but uh um so the doctor said nothing to diet doesn't work. There's no, there's no evidence that diet has a role in this, which I think is just ludicrous. I mean, particularly when we're talking about the gastrointestinal system, I think I could kind of see where people say, well, maybe arthritis isn't related to diet, but you know, in my view, it clearly is. But to say that the GI system diet has no impact on, on these disease states, particularly the GI system is, is bizarre and crazy to me. Um, so 90%. And so this is interesting because I want, you know, there are a lot of people that do the carnivore diet as an elimination diet and they, it, it fixes whatever problem they have. And, um, then they go and, uh, you know, then they start reintroducing some foods, which I think is 
perfectly appropriate to try that, you know, to see what you can do. So what did you find a period of time where you, you said you went into pretty much full remission, you felt good, and then you decide you're going to put some foods back in. So how did that go? Did you have some, some, some ones that are like definitely no goes and they flared you back up or how was that transition back to sort of a 90% rather than a hundred percent carnivore diet? Um, I mean, I think doing the zero carb carnivore diet, like clearly it works. It just, it can be definitely hard to sustain and being like a young guy just starting my career. And like a lot of kids my age are like trying to eat out all the time. So you just sort of have to make things work and sort of, but you don't want to jeopardize your health because like at the end of the day, like I would never want to have to go through a flare of a gang. So that it definitely can like almost ruin your life. Like you just go to a very isolated place where you're just, I don't know you definitely just don't really want to be around people. And it's just like a very dark like time and sort of like, you're so grateful. It's good to like be grateful and realize each day that's a blessing to have good health. But um, when it comes to foods, I was reintroducing definitely higher fat foods, like plant foods, like coconuts, avocados, they, they did well with me and then berries. So like, I'll stick with like blueberries, blackberries, strawberries, and, um, those generally do well, but I just make sure I never really exceed 20 grams of fiber per day, just as a rule of thumb, because like you do not need that much fiber and that can definitely like cause inflammation or something. Now, did Were there any foods that did not do well? Did any that you tried and said, oh, this is not going to work? Um, so before I discovered you and Dr. Saladino, I was trying to figure things out, out like sort of my own, just the trial and error and like, other people's testimonials. And um, like, I'm sure you've heard like the theory that like, oh, prebiotics, if you eat a lot of prebiotic fiber, that helps restore your gut health along with probiotics. So I was eating a lot of like insoluble, I mean, soluble fibers. So like, um, I don't know, like acacia fiber, like supplementing with that and all these other things and trying to make sure I'm eating tons of probiotics and taking probiotic supplements. But it was just like more supplements and less food. And it didn't really make a whole lot of sense. And it, um, I don't know, it, I definitely... All right, can you repeat the question? I feel like I got off track there. I was just asking, you know, if any foods gave you a, a significant negative reaction either before or you went on the diet or I guess after for sure. Yeah, yeah, that brings me back to my point. So like I was, I was um, experimenting more with that fiber route and then I would throw in foods like nuts and like raw vegetables and stuff. Those definitely were the hardest in my stomach. So insoluble fiber in general, so like raw kale, spinach, nuts, anything that, puts a lot of pressure and it's sort of sharp that goes through the intestines. Those are no goes. And definitely I could feel it like the next day, even if it didn't it to get a flare, you could feel like that pain, like within your intestines, like something's like lodged in there. Sometimes it feels like, like almost like barbed wire. It feels crazy. And I'm just looking through the comments and, and Cassie, one of our regulars is saying she, she's had also had ulcerative colitis, IBS, and she's had a colonoscopy, which shows a tremendous improvement in uh, the UC, which is awesome to see. Did they, did they ever do any kind of imaging or colonoscopies or anything like that on you when you were being worked up for this? Like when um, I healed or beforehand? No, when, when they made the diagnosis. Yeah, they did a colonoscopy and it was like okay. a pretty inflamed colon for sure. Yeah, and, and have you had any follow-up imaging or anything like that, been, to, been, to, been back to the doctor since you've gotten better? Um. Since I've gotten better, it's been like two years or yeah, about two years now. So I haven't, but once I sort of started feeling better, I don't know, there's sort of like that bad relationship that I feel like I've developed over the years with that distrust for doctors and not really trusting them. So I'm sort of like, I feel better. It's not worth going back and talking to them because what their advice has been in the past hasn't been good. But like, I think a colonoscopy is worth doing again, but I haven't ever been have any bloody stools since, but I think it's something worth doing just for the confirmation. Yeah, I, well, I think, you know, as much as people have lost faith in physicians, uh, I don't think physicians are necessarily doing, acting so in bad faith. I think they just don't understand or don't know. And so I think it's always nice when so you can demonstrate, hey, look, I did this and I got better. And then maybe, maybe that, because he's going to see a lot more Crohn's patients than the average person is, or a lot more UC patients. That's going to be a you know, 10% of his practice or something like that. So he'll have the opportunity to maybe, some of them are more open-minded, will share that with their patients and then we can maybe help change this, this situation. Where There's a, a gastroenterologist by the name of Pran Yoganathan out of Australia who we interviewed, who is all on board with carnivore and he sees tremendous benefits. So if, you know, if at some point, and I know 
to do a procedure, a colonoscopy is not without risk. I mean, certainly that's not a uh, procedure that I would suggest you just, you know, it's a, there, there's risk with that. So you have to be kind of weigh that in mind. Um, mm -hmm. So what were you finding difficulty? I mean, you're young and presumably you maybe want to want to exercise and that stuff was, was the ulcer colitis impacting your ability to participate in life in any way? And how has it been since that's been improved? I mean, I think more on like a psychological level, because when you have like symptoms of ulcer colitis, you definitely lose a lot of weight and you're just very self-conscious. You have like a very pale complexion, your skin is all broken out. So like that probably was my main issue. Like it, it psychologically, I just didn't want to like show my face in the classroom. Like I missed a lot of classes in college and, um, yeah, I think that was probably the toughest part of the whole thing. Like, I wasn't, like, too weak or gaunt to attend the gym. Like, I didn't have that much blood loss because I definitely found the more I was finding blood in my stool, the less I would eat just because I know, like, it's something I'm putting in my body. Like, I had a decent, like, concept of, like, what comes in must come out. So, like, I don't know. I didn't have too much blood loss to the point where I was, like, fainting in the gym or anything, but I've always been an active gym goer. And are you finding that, uh, you know, a diet that's high in meat has been helpful at retaining muscle or, or made no difference? Or what's been your experience with that? Um, it definitely makes a big difference. I think the like amino acid ratio definitely makes more sense than plant compounds when it comes to like retaining muscle, like the leucine and whatnot. But yeah, I think I've definitely put on healthy size and like muscle and, um, yeah, minimal fat is definitely very hard to put on fat too. So it's like sort of how humans were meant to look too. Like I feel like over time when we're eating the wrong foods, we look sort of distorted, but I haven't experienced that yet. Thank God. What's been the uh, sort of, what's been the uh, reaction from family members, parents perhaps about you doing this and going meat-based? Are they gloom and doom? You're going to die of colon cancer and which is very ironic is you probably are aware that getting a diagnosis of ulcerative colitis dramatically increases your risk for colon cancer, something like, you know, it's like a 3000 uh, percent in, in increase. So, so a 30 times X risk of colorectal cancer, if you have active UC or Crohn's. And so what has been your, the parents or family members response to, to this dietary choice? I mean, I'm very lucky. My parents have been incredibly supportive. Like my dad's been super open-minded and uh, he's actually done not necessarily a carnivore diet, but sort of like the 80, 20 rule, like 80%, um, like carnivore and 20%, like potatoes and whole foods and whatnot. He's lost like 20 pounds. So he's been super encouraging of the idea of just like taking responsibility on my own and not relying on like a medication to solve all my issues for me. And my mom's been slower to come around to it, but she's, also lost probably five or 10 pounds now, but it took like a year for her to really sort of believe what I'm saying too. Cause like when you start learning more and more about like the carnivore diet and getting healthy, you don't see results overnight. So like when you're talking about it, it's like, if I don't look fully healthy, I don't seem credible. So people sort of don't believe you, but over time I've gotten healthier. My parents and family are all like definitely benefiting a lot too, by just like eliminating oils, just all concepts of just eating whole foods. But I'm the one who pretty much eats the most animal products, but I have a twin brother and an older brother too, and they're big into eating a lot more animal products as well. But nobody's 100% carnivore at this point, but everyone's a lot healthier, like way healthier. Yeah, and uh, you said you are, where, where are you at? What are you doing these days? I remember you, met, you said you were in school. Are you out of school? What are you doing from a day-to-day -day position? Yeah, so I graduated last May. 2020, and now I'm doing accounting for an accounting firm in Baltimore, Maryland, Price Warehouse. Okay, yeah, I've heard of them. So, <laughs> anyway, what? Uh, so you've got a website, I believe, that I looked at a little bit. It was you're, you know, kind of sharing this information with other people uh, that may be suffering from ulcerative colitis. Are you getting much traction with that? <laughs> no, not really. Unfortunately, not. it's sort of hard uh, trying to juggle everything at once, but. I've got it up and running and like, I'm trying to, it's hard to get people to the forum because that's mainly what I want. Something sort of like a community tailored to people with Crohn's and colitis, because like it would have been a nice resource for me to have back when I had it, when I was going through symptoms. So I figure like there's gotta be somebody else out there who could benefit from this. So that's sort of like the idea behind that. 
Yeah, when and you know these days, you know, if you get diagnosed with a disease, I mean, the first thing people do is they hop on the internet and look for a support group or a forum or some sort of information in addition to what maybe they get from their physician. Did you look out at you know Crohn's disease, IBD resources, you know, ulcerative colitis resources prior to changing diet? What do you mean, like resources? Well, did you go online and start looking at other people's experience with ulcerative colitis and, and try to figure it out that way? I mean, I know you said you found about myself and others, and uh, that was obviously through looking on the internet, I would assume. But I mean, I mean, there are ulcerative colitis Facebook groups and so on and so forth. Did you try to utilize any of those? Um, no Facebook groups. Like, I haven't been too big into social media. Like, I pretty much just have that Instagram to follow nutritionists like you. And um, yeah, I mainly, the only things I found on blog was typically just like people complaining about how they're going to the bathroom like 20, 30 times a day. And it was all just like scary information. Like the real information I found, which was great, was on like YouTube. I thought YouTube definitely opened up my world to, to healing IBD. Yeah, I just wonder because I, I know I've heard of other people that uh, there's another fellow by the name of Adam Viscovich who I interviewed, you know, uh, I think about two years ago. Same thing, ulcer colitis, you know, young, healthy, active guy was really, you know, putting a significant damper on his ability to, to participate in life and he did the same thing went carnivore completely resolved it but he was you know he was saying that he was i believe trying to participate in some of these on, uh, online forums and it was very it was very much there was a lot of backlash against it how dare you tell people to eat a meat-based diet on, on you know there was a lot of pushback on this i was wondering if you so so do you know any other people with also colitis have anybody come up to you or approached you at this point um, so I had a roommate back, like I went to Catholic University, like I guess last year when I graduated. So I roomed with a kid who had a Crohn's disease, who was like my roommate and buddy. And so did, has he tried to diet or what is, what's going on with him? Um, it's interesting. Like he, he takes Humira and he witnessed me in remission the whole entire year we were together doing the carnivore diet. And like, he loves meat, especially eating like his family has like a kielbasa sausage recipe they're passionate about. So he's a big meat eater, but he just, I don't know. I think when food is so hyper palatable and you have all these fast options, it's tempting to just take a medication and not deal with it, just eating meat or and like going that route. So I think that was his mindset. Yeah. So did you notice like outside of the ulcerative colitis, any other improvements or, or changes in health or worsening of health since doing this diet? Um, I mean, definitely nothing worsening it, but I do notice like if I eat, I mean, nothing from the carnivore, but I feel like if I eat fiber, like I definitely feel a little more cloudy. My stomach's not as, it just doesn't feel as light. My, my thinking doesn't seem as clear, but when I'm doing like, <clears throat> excuse me, um, when I'm doing a strict carnivore diet, I definitely feel my best. So, but I think in keeping the fat high, like I've been buying a lot of suet from like a farmer and, um, like lamb suet and it's, it definitely helps when you eat more fat. Like if I just stick with like too much protein or 85, 15 ground beef too much, like too much of meat in general, I find it a little harder to sustain, but if you can get like grass fed butter or a suet or tallow or any other animal sources, like it definitely, that helps you feel at your very best, or at least that's what I've noticed from my experience. Yeah. And you said that, uh, you um, limit fiber to 20 grams a day if you eat fiber. Do you, do you feel that it's necessary to eat fiber for you or do you, does it make a difference if you, do you feel better with it or without it? I definitely feel better without it. It's just like blueberries taste delicious. Sometimes I'm just a weak man. And like, if, as long as I'm not cracking open Oreo cookies and I'm not putting like toxic substances in my body, it's like, I have to just make sure I keep it sustainable. That's sort of my mindset at this point, but you do not need fiber. At least I do not need fiber by any means. Yeah. Um, what has been, uh, I guess, uh, you're, you, you know, have you seen any negatives from the diet? I mean, I guess when you're first starting it, if you go cold turkey with um, all the fiber, like you'd have a fiber rich diet and then you go right into carnivore. Like I sort of did that. You definitely have a phase where you go through like the diarrhea and your bowel movements definitely have to adjust. But after you get through that, it's, it, it's been smooth sailing for me. You did this while you're in, I guess you said you did this while you're in college still. So a lot of people in college are wondering because, you know, it's, sometimes you don't have the greatest income uh, while, while in school. How did you manage that while on a, on a college budget? 
Um, definitely did a lot of fasting. Like I did one meal a day for a good bit. I mean, it didn't necessarily need to, like, it wasn't like I was starving myself, but I definitely had to sort of buckle up. Like I was working two jobs in like the business school and, um, buying like organic stuff, which I don't think is hundred percent necessary to buying organic meats, or organic eggs, but I was making sure to do that just so I cover all my bases. And, um, that's how I did. I definitely would have all my meal in one sitting just so I wouldn't like have multiple meals a day. So I just eat less food in general. And how about today? What is your, what is your, I guess, what does your daily pattern look like as far as meals? Is it pretty much the same stuff every day or is it, do you have a lot of variety or how's it, how's a week, how's a typical week look for you? I mean, meal timing can change day per day. Like sometimes I'll fast till noon. Sometimes I'll eat uh, breakfast, but usually it's very similar meals each day. Like I eat a lot of like lamb suet that I get from the farmer and I mix that with like scrambled eggs and, uh, Sometimes I'll throw in bacon or a little bit of chicken. Like it's, it definitely changes. I'm a big into making omelets and I love eggs. Like I eat a ton of eggs per day. And then, um, dinner, it's some sort of meat, whether it's chicken, beef, steak. And then like, I'll have like a honey or berries typically at night too. Cause it's nice to sort of be in ketosis and then have your carbs at night to sort of help with sleep. So that's sort of my strategy. Yeah. And, and um, <clears throat> do you, um, you said you, you, you find that if you eat too much protein, so how do you do, how would you define that? I mean, do you, do you any idea of like relatively how much fat and protein you're eating? Um, I mean, I don't track it anymore, but if I had to guess probably, Hmm. Probably like 200 to 250 grams of fat per day, and then 150 to 175 grams of protein per day, and then yeah. carbs never really exceed 100. Yeah. Okay. So you're so you're you're definitely on the kind of the ketogenic side of of, of of the diet as far as that's going on. And then when you say you know carbs 100 grams, what are you what are the ones you typically? You said you said some blueberries and avocado. Is that still pretty much what you're what you're at these days? Yeah. So mainly blueberries and honey, but probably once a week I'll have avocado or like a coconut product of some sort. Cause like they, I mean, sometimes I'll buy like an ice cream that's like a coconut product. It's basically like coconut or sprouts has like an ice cream that's like no sugar added. That's like vanilla, it's really good. So it has a few ingredients in it though, that they're not too sketchy. It's like coconut oil, erythritol, like vanilla beans, and then there's like guar gum and xanthan gum or something, which definitely isn't great for my stomach. And like I might be bloated or gassy the next day, but if I can be moderate with it, usually there's no trouble. And like I haven't seen any UC symptoms or anything from it, but I'll have that ice cream every once in a while. Did you, when you were, as part of the workup for UC, were there any labs? Did you look at inflammatory markers, CR, C-reactive protein, or even a fecal calprotectin or any of those, any of those things? Did you have any of those things done when you were first diagnosed? Um, I believe I did. I mean, obviously I don't have them with me, but I'm pretty sure I did, but I like just didn't think anything of them. I was just sort of like stunned at the fact that I got diagnosed for a disease at such a young age. Yeah. Other than your symptomatic improvements, a lack of, you know, frequent bowel movements and pain and perhaps bleeding. Were there any other objective signs that the UC has gotten better that you can point to? That it's gotten better? Yeah. I mean, any, any kind of laboratory results that would say, you know, I was inflamed and and, and these have gotten better or is it just mostly mostly just symptomatic wise? Um, yeah, I mean, there's, I don't have any, like anything written on paper if this isn't better. Like, I, I mean, I guess I could, it would make sense, but I just haven't, I haven't done that. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, I mean, regardless of what the labs are showing, I mean, we're, 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 most people are concerned about how they're doing symptomatically, you know? And so that's, I think that's the end of the day. What everybody wants is to feel better. Um, so you are in an age demographic, you know, you're probably, I'm, I'm probably a little bit more than twice as old as you are, but, um, there's a big push, I guess, to, to sort of plant, go to plant-based diets. You know, a lot of younger people are sort of taking that up. They believe it's helpful for the environment. Do you have a lot of people in your social circles that are, that believe that way? And if so, how do you sort of manage that? Um, 
It's kind of a difficult scenario because I mean, I don't know anyone who's too passionate about like veganism that's in my friend group, but like, I'll try to point people in the right direction and sort of mention that like saturated from, or fat from meat, like isn't everything that's made out to be like what you read in articles online and whatnot. But I don't know. I think from what I can see, like from a roommate I have, he still gets sort of like, I don't know. I can't believe it's not butter. It's hard to really register in their mind that this, the proper way of eating is more animal based. We've thrived on it for like millions of years since we discovered hunting. So it's very difficult to get your message across unless they're experiencing like a, a health crisis themselves. Like that's the kind of sadness with that. Like people are not very open-minded to changing what they're doing. Yeah. And since, I mean, have you, you know, obviously like when I guess I made a transition and what, when I kind of lost faith in nutrition science or, you know, so to speak, you know, and this, this goes back probably gosh, seven or eight years ago. And, and it's not that I don't believe the people doing it are honest and have integrity. I just, I think the, the, the science can't tell us what people think it can tell us, like how long you're going to live or, or are you going to get heart disease in 30 years or cancer? I think it's, I think that's just the data will never support that, or at least unless we're willing to do unethical billion dollar studies, which will never happen. But so, so you know, you kind of, sort of question some of these things or does it has, has it changed your mindset in general are you kind of more skeptical about other things now or uh, has it led you to question other things and if so what i mean absolutely i don't want to get too political but i mean with everything going on with the election i mean it's pretty obvious there, there's agendas being pushed and it's i don't know it's scary and i hope things change you know the same people that are in politics that are pushing big corporations and what's being put online and in the media. And it's not the right information. Well, I mean, I, you know, I've been around for a while. I'm, I, I, I'm not sort of, sort of so naive to think that politicians aren't corrupt. I mean, that's pretty much comes with the, I think that comes with the job description and, and certainly corporate interests are always going to be there. And so we've, you know, I don't, you know, the, the thing about change, I mean, that's the only guarantee of things will always change. Now the question is, does that change suit you or I or someone else? You know, it's the eye of the beholder, I suppose. And so we're all in this sort of situation. You have to, uh, you know, you have to, you have to be able to adapt to it and thrive and overcome. And I think, you know, obviously I think it starts with having a healthy body in mind. I think that's, that's a first starting point. And that's what this sort of seems to do. Um, so accounting, um, what, what, do you have any goals in life? I know it may be too early to say, but how do you see yourself five years from now as far as, I mean, are you, I mean, hopefully healthy, do you have any goals outside of doing, you know, doing accounting stuff or what are your thoughts? I mean, hopefully there's no workers in this, uh, this chat room right now from PwC, but I definitely like to do something entrepreneurial and, um, run a business. My, my parents are both small business owners and like, I'd love to do something like that. Like it'd be great to do something in the nutrition world, but it just seems hard because especially in America, you need some sort of certification to have credibility. And I don't know, I would love to do something with nutrition, but I'm not a hundred percent sure where to start with that because I don't want to go through some school that's teaching the wrong information and just to get some certification so I can be credible to clients, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, credibility, you can earn credibility. You know, there's, a, there's, a, there's different thoughts on how credibility is. And there's, there's, there's even a, uh, you know, I think rightfully so there's some people critic you know, critical of the current education system. And, you know, is it, is it worth it? You know, do you get, do you get out of it uh, what you need to succeed in the world? And that, whether it's to land a job or just to, you know, grow your own business, there's a lot of, you know, obviously you look at guys, that were college dropouts and are now multi-billionaires or high school dropouts even that are, that have done well. So there's a lot of ways to get around that. And, you know, I, I, I'm less, you know, I went through a traditional route of college, you know, professional degree, so on and so forth, medical school residency, all that stuff. And, you know, in retrospect, seeing where I ended up, you know, perhaps I, I could have gotten there a lot quicker without all that stuff in there, but it's hard to say. Um, do you, um, do you find that, uh, I mean, are, are your thoughts on sticking with this diet indefinitely? Do you think it's easy to do? I mean, you, you, and this is, I think, a fair criticism. A lot of people see people on a carnivore diet and say, I could never do that. I could never just eat meat for the rest of my life. And I think that's, you know, quite honestly, I don't know that I'll do that. I mean, I mean, I'm so far, so, so far, so good for almost, you know, four and a half years in. But 
Um, I wonder if, uh, you know, you find like, where is this level of sustainability is 90% carnivore totally cool. And you could, you could see yourself doing that the rest of your life. Or do you think, cause there are a lot of people, there's this, this concept of regression to the mean where people will do this sort of extreme thing and then they'll all kind of end up in the same place. And where that same place is, is often standard American diet. I mean, people ask me what's the easiest diet to follow. And I said, the standard American diet is because it's easy. I mean, it's convenient. It's junk food. It tastes good. I mean, it doesn't, it's not actually healthy, but it's easy to follow for sure. And the food manufacturers, you know, make it so easy, you know, and society makes it so easy. You know, there was an interesting survey done not too long ago on, on I guess maybe it was millennial generation people. And I don't know, what is a cutoff? I'm like, you, there's a generation, what it's X. And then I think I'm generation X and then there's millennials and before me was baby boomers. And then there's generation Z now or something like that. I don't know where you're at, but yeah. is that where you are? Are you in Z? I was born in 1997, so I think I'm a millennial, but like I'm not much sure. I don't know. I think millennials started. I don't remember generation. What was that? Generation X. I think 63 or something like that was Generation X. Or it depends on where you read that. But, um, but you know, as far as going forward, do you see what you're doing today? Mostly meat, mostly animal products, a little bit of fruit and avocado and stuff like that. Do you do you find that to be something you could do for decades? Oh, 100. percent I think. It's a little less sustainable for sure if you're just doing the all meat. I mean, I think you can do it. I think it's great for resolving autoimmune issues. But for the long term, definitely throwing in fruits, mainly fruits. And if you're going to eat vegetables, I would definitely recommend cooking them. But I pretty much avoid vegetables altogether at this point. But um, I think it's sustainable for sure. Yeah, I mean, I've never had a, a, a like for vegetables. You know, it was an acquired taste. I, you know, I, I think if you put enough goat cheese on a on a roasted beet or, a, you know, bait, something like that, or you put enough bacon around some Brussels sprouts, they become, you know, almost edible. But, uh, you know, I never, I never got into vegetables. Even as a kid, I remember uh, sitting there staring at a plate of meatloaf that my dad put onions in. And I was like, I hate onions. Why'd you put them in there? And his answer was, you can't even taste them. And I said, well, if you can't taste them, why'd you put them in there, dad? And it was just shut up and eat your food, boy. <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. So I never liked those damn things. And it was kind of funny. I was talking to my dad about that. And he goes, yeah, I never really liked them either. And I said, what the hell, dad? Why'd you make me eat that stuff? He goes, well, you know, that's the way it was. You're supposed to eat your vegetables. But uh, yeah, I mean, I would agree. I think that if, if, if we're saying that, and, and I will say this, you know, without without hesitation, I think meat is the ultimate food. I think that's what we're designed to eat. And then we're looking at things that are, probably not that bad for us you know it's clearly the modern industrial food you know the processed garbage it's there hyper processed food hyper palatable food the, the the you know the modern combinations of corn oil and you know corn syrup or sorry and uh, seed oils and uh, ultra refined you know grains is just a disaster for us and then 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 there's things down there and i would agree that probably fruit is probably something that is you know of the, the lesser of certain evils for sure you know, so I'd rather have fruits, fruits and vegetables and my kids are the same way. I mean, I'll feed them and they love meat and eggs and I'll feed, feed them a ton of that. And then they'll have a piece of fruit if they want. They they never ask for vegetables. They've never, my children have never asked me every once in a while, my daughter will sell like a carrot. But I mean, other than that, it's like, Hey daddy, can I have a big old thing of Brussels sprouts? Never, never going to happen. Broccoli and never do that. I remember when they were younger and I would try to force them to eat, you know, broccoli and I would, you know, okay, you eat, but you got to have broccoli, you got to eat your broccoli. And, and I don't know. And, you know, I just trying to be the good dad. And I realized, man, it was always such a fight and struggle to get those kids to eat it. And there's a reason for that. But anyway, some people will say it's, you know, that, you know, I think we, in, we innately know what's not good for us. And I think most people innately know that vegetables are, are not particularly palatable and you know some places around the world where that's the only thing you got so i mean when it comes to starvation versus vegetables i'm gonna eat my vegetables for sure but if we have an option and of course the counter of that is well people and my daughter asked me that why daddy why isn't i wish sugar was healthy for us and i said well i do too because i would sure the hell eat the hell out of it you know because it tastes good but i think that's the thing is sugar is something that you can't it, it would have never been available to us in the quantities it's available to us now you know you might have been very rare to come across some berries in season depending upon what part of the world you're in or you know perhaps honey you know so anyway that, that, uh, and i think that is that, that's something that's finding what's sustainable for you over the long haul and do you ever find that and you mentioned this a little bit that there's times where you know you kind of go you know in this sort of not fully carnivore but you know 90 percent, 80 percent, and then 
Do you find it, hey, I need to tighten it back up for a while? Do you ever get in a situation where I'm going to, I'm going to, like, well, carnivore month is this month. And this is every year on this, this time. I mean, I eat a carnivore diet year round, but I include eggs and dairy and some spices. But during this time of the year, I tend to go straight, strict red meat. And that's what I've been doing. It's the 10th day of this, I'm doing it. And I, I always feel better when I do this. But do you find that when you fluctuate, do you fluctuate a little bit? Yeah. So I do, I try to do like, um, I'll do like a month where I do carnival. Unfortunately, I did it in September, so I'm not partaking in a little carnival month, which is a bit of a bummer. But um, yeah, for sure. Like if I overdo it on fiber, it's like not perfect. Usually I'll not, I'll go for like 20 grams of fiber, like I said, per day if I eat fiber that day. But if I go and accidentally eat 30 or 40 grams or something along the lines of that, I'll definitely be like, oh my goodness, my stomach feels so full. And I'll either fast or I'll just make sure I'm not eating any fiber so I can sort of get back into that, like, yeah, I think it's a state of ketosis or something where you just sort of wait it out, you go to the bathroom, your stomach feels a lot lighter, feels a lot better, and, like, you slowly feel better as that fiber sort of gets back out of your body. Speaking of, did you ever, when you talk about ketosis, was that something you ever tracked or worried about, or was it, were you measuring ketones at some point? I was, like... When I first started getting into the keto diet, it was my junior year at university. So it was like, I guess, a little over two years ago. So, um, yeah, I tracked ketones then. Yeah, you know, and I think this is something that a lot of people, I mean, more people are coming to understand. I think that, you know, initially, particularly when you go on one of these ketogenic type diets, people will often have relatively high ketones, and then that will start to you know, they'll, they'll start to drop down as, as you get more efficient at utilizing them. And, and then there's people that get worried about that and they try to keto harder where they'll start adding in more fats and more fats and more fats and fasting longer just so they can get those ketone levels. And with, with, with that, well, that might potentially be um, not helpful. I mean, you might've done the things that are necessary to, to improve your health. And, and even though your ketones aren't registering high amounts, um, you can actually probably be, you know, trying to, ketoing too hard i suppose i don't know if that's something that does that make sense to you yeah it definitely does i think you can get into that game where you're sort of chasing numbers and you're not really seeing things as clearly that's why i'm not 100 percent about going and getting my blood work done because i think it's just like you get to the point where you're so hyper competitive with yourself i'm just trying to beat your previous score whatever it is and like i don't know i've been into that before and it's not like a great mindset for me just from my experience i feel like i'm just sort of distracted with all this stuff revolving around myself instead of what's really important, like family, friends, other stuff, my job, or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, so do you find that uh, how hard is it to, to, you know, with a job, is it inconvenient for you to eat this way? Do you find it challenging or is it pretty, pretty straightforward? Do you cook at home and then do you eat at, eat at work or how do you do that? Um, so I've been working from home. So like pretty much nothing is in office except a few assignments, but, um, yeah, so I'm pretty much just working from home and I just, I take my time and I cook my food and I don't like taking shortcuts and eating keto snacks or anything like that. Like if they want to give me a hard time about it, I can explain what's going on, but it's like, I, my health is my definitely my top priority and I'm not going to start eating crap or like going out with them and drinking just for, to fit into their culture. Like health is more important to me and just like staying true to myself for sure. Yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned the drinking. Obviously, we kind of kidded about that, about the college stuff. And I mean, that's, that's you know, a lot of people, that's part of college is to, you know, kind of have fun and party and stuff like that, and run mm -hmm. around, chase girls or whatever you're doing. But, um, you know, the, uh, um, yeah, and I used to not, and that was like, I wouldn't go in until all the lights were turned off and the whole town, it seemed like, it stay out all night, you know. But uh, do you find it, uh, uh, so alcohol, um, how does that impact your, your gut health? I mean, I'm not a big drinker. I barely drink anymore at this point. Like the last drink I probably had was over the summer with the family. Like we're celebrating because everyone was like together, like my older brother, twin brother, and my parents. So I had like a glass of wine. And like if I'm moderate and I just stick to wine, not like hard liquor or beers, I'm good. I'm sure you can get away with like mixed drinks, like seltzers and like a clear vodka or something. But I just don't. I don't like getting back into the, the alcohol world. It's just, I don't know. It takes you back to like not a good place and just, I don't know, feeling hungover doesn't feel good, but I don't think it affects my gut health too much unless I really overdo it. But I haven't done that since like literally freshman year of college. So 
Yeah. Okay. That's fair enough. Yeah. That's one of those things. A lot of people ask me questions about, can I drink alcohol on this diet? And I'm like, you know, that's, it doesn't matter what diet you're on. It's still alcohol is still, uh, you know, basically, uh, you know, ethanol is a metabolic poison essentially, you know, and you know, whether you, whether you want to believe that or not, it's still the, still the truth. And, uh, uh, it's not to say that you can't do it. And I mean, I'll have a glass of wine occasionally, but I, I'm not pretending that it's some kind of health food for me. I think that's, you know, you kind of, you're willing to take a certain amount of risk benefit. And some people, the, you know, they draw the line there. Um, you know, and this is a thing you mentioned about, uh, so you're in, you said you're in, you're in Maryland. Is that right? Yeah. Baltimore, Maryland. Yeah. And so how is, how, uh, cause I haven't heard much about Maryland. I mean, we hear a lot about DC, which is obviously right down the street, but, um, is, 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 a, is the environment pretty sort of locked down or what's, uh, what's the, uh, you know, what's the situation like in that part of the country? Um, so currently it's, it's not great. You pretty much like the mayor of Baltimore wants everyone to wear a mask, like wherever you go. And, um, like you've mentioned the studies, how the masks, like basically there's a lot of research showing that they don't do anything. Like they're not preventing the virus at all. And they're like, enforcing it at gyms like they're now saying like okay even when you're partaking in a high intensity activity you need to wear a mask at all times like you, you used to be able to like swing kettlebells around or do cardio and not have to wear a mask and then once you get off you wear the mask but now you have to wear it 24 7 unless you're drinking water and then if you're out in public i don't know you're supposed to wear a mask not everyone does it but baltimore people definitely like give you dirty looks and will say stuff to you if you're not wearing a mask. So it just feels like we're living in like a communist country or something. It's like, it's not a great place to be. Like, it's very, like, I don't want to say it's negative, but it's, it's pretty negative. Like, so like currently I'm back at home with the parents now I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do with the lease situation, but I can't, it's very difficult to be in the city right now. Interesting. Yeah. I, I'm in, I'm in Southern California and it's, uh, you know, I mean, indoors, you know, it's, it's pretty much, you know, you're going to, you're going to be forced to wear a mask if you go into a shopping center or something like that outdoors, you know, it seems pretty mixed. I don't really pay attention to that. I just kind of, you know, I don't, I don't find, I find no benefit to wearing a mask outdoors. And as a surgeon, I wore a mask my entire career and I was very cognizant of the fact that I wasn't wearing it because I was preventing viral spread to, to my patients. I mean, that's just not why you do that, but, uh, mm -hmm. You know, I think it is for the people that are supportive of that. You know, I think that the data shows that, you know, a surgical mask um, that's brand new can have some effect. But, you know, most people uh, I see it, it's hanging from their windshield, you know, their, their rear view mirror thrown on the seat of the car seat. They're, they're over. They're using it over and over again. The cloth masks almost have negligible impact at all and most people they wear them over and over again and they're they become dirty and you know contaminated and so it's 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 sort of i don't feel any comfort by putting a mask on whatsoever there's no i don't feel like oh my gosh i'm protecting myself or saving somebody else by doing that but that's that's a controversial topic and a lot of people get mad when you talk about that for sure um yeah like from what i've seen it's just like it's creating tension between the people that's pretty much the biggest impact that it's making like Everyone sort of just like you'll walk by somebody and then they'll slide their mask on open. And it's like that's offending people. If anything, you're not saving my life or whatever you think you're doing. It's just it's creating tensions, making people have a distrust for one another, and that's not what society needs. Yeah, there's definitely some there's definitely some 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 definite polarization around any, many of these topics, which has it's been unfortunate and it's uh, been uh, it's kind of a shame to see. Hopefully, we get back to being human beings again and. Uh, you know, all being on the same team because it's, it is, it is a little, it is a little stressful and it does wear people down. Um, well, let me, I guess this is the one thing that, you know, is probably just as an important part, you know, there's a mental health side of diet. Do you, do you find that the, you know, cause this is a stressful time, regardless of your position, uh, you know, do you find that the diet has been helpful with sort of mental health mood and that type of stuff? Yes, I, I definitely think so. I think for whatever reason, when you're constantly spiking insulin or blood sugar, whatever it is with like high carbohydrate foods, foods, your mood is definitely sort of up and down, up and down and just sort of dictates your energy too. That's why I definitely will feel more tired if I have like a heavier carb meal. But um, yeah, I think your mood is a lot more stable when you're eating high fat, 
moderate protein or just fat and protein in general. I definitely, from my experience, it sounds better. Yeah. And your, your experience is definitely not unique. I think, I think pretty much most of us uh, seem to notice that, that, that move just kind of chilled out and, and generally, you know, on the happier side, I think that's where most of us find some people call that a carnivore calm or zero carbs in or whatever name they want to put on that. But I think there's definitely something there uh, with that. Um, do you, um, outside of diet to impact the ulcerative class, were there other things you did, lifestyle things, sleep, circadian rhythm stuff, uh, exercise that, that made an impact on your ulcerative colitis? Um, I think exercise definitely been a big factor. I mean, obviously other areas to touch on that, but, um, I really like enjoy working out with kettlebells just for the sake that like they're a full body movement and they're great because like one particular muscle group isn't super sore. So you can sort of hit them each day. So you can get like that 20 minute workout in every single day. And it's definitely really beneficial for mental health. And then sleep, I'm just sort of like, I don't know, almost like an old man. Like I go to sleep pretty early. Like I go to bed at like nine or 10 and just have like a structured routine where I go to bed, whether or go to bed and wake up at the same time each day, whether it's a weekend or weekday. So. Yeah, I was, I was up late for me last night. I was up till 11. My son and I were watching, <laughs> we were watching Guga foods. I don't know if you know who that is, but anyway, if you guys haven't yeah. Googled Guga G U G A, he, he makes these crazy, mostly meat based dishes. You know, he's got this, you know, these, he's in there dry aging Wagyu, you know, pecan. Oh, wow steaks and you know grilling it up and it just it's just you just sit there and drool the whole time you're watching this and it's a funny thing like my goal one of my goals in my life is to eat, eat a meal with that guy you know maybe maybe it'll happen at some point you know he's down in miami florida so if we end up down in that little part of the part of the world i'll see if i can chase him down and get him to get on the carnivore train because uh he's uh he's definitely on the meat train we just got to get him on uh more uh, carnivore based but uh interesting so um where can people go to find out about you? And I know you got a, what's the name of your website? So it's called eatwithpurpose.org. Gotcha. It's like a forum based website, similar to Reddit, which is like open form discussion. We just talk about your experience and post about whatever you want. And what are the feet? I, I, like I said, I, I kind of read through the, through it a little bit and I saw, you know, just basically, you know, you're talking about an animal based diet, you know, a certain percentage, about 80% or more, and then a few other foods in there. What, what kind of things you guys do and talk about on that site? Yes, there's another section besides the forum that's like my experience, how I healed. And then I touch up a little bit on history, just like over the past 200 or 2 million years, um, humans, once they discovered me and how much it impacted their brain growth, like sort of going on along with the, uh, the expensive tissue hypothesis, sort of talking about that. And then I do a history of um, like the past 100 or so years, um, what's changed with nutrition, why metabolic disease is like skyrocketed obesity, all of that. And just gives like sort of a simplistic timeline of like what's changed over the past hundred years. I could sort of be contributing towards disease, IBD, obesity. So that's basically it. Yeah. And IBD is on the rise for people that don't know. I mean, it's, it's incident has gone up pretty dramatically over the last, you know, several decades and continues to do so. And it's, it's a, you know, we, we've got a lot of people in this community that, that have had it or suffered from it. And, and fortunately are finding uh, uh, significant improvement by doing this. So, um, well, anyway, where, what about social media? What was your social media on? You said you got a, an Instagram account or something like that. I mean, I'm honestly not too big on social media. Like I pretty much just have that account to, uh, to follow like nutritionists and stuff. Like I don't even use like my full name just because I don't want people to sort of follow me on it. Honestly, like I'm not, I've like, I don't know. My wife grew up in the social media age and got rid of it at the end of my high school experience. So I just like, I don't know. I'm not too big into social media, unfortunately, but it stinks because like to build a business today, it helps a ton, but like, I don't know. I just find life is better without it. Yeah, there's definitely something to say. It's definitely a double-edged sword. And, you know, yes, from a business standpoint, it certainly can, you know, it's, I think most people can see that's a huge, huge advantage for business, but at the same time, it can do some pretty negative things to, to your life for sure. So, all right. Well, I'll tell you what, Jack, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Uh, I hope you have a great Sunday. Uh, certainly, uh, you're welcome in this community at any time and, uh, hopefully, uh, 
uh, you, 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 you've been able to utilize it and you look at some of the resources we have. We have a lot of resources on gut health and Crohn's. And I would, you know, I mean, if you want to look at, uh, I think Dr. Pran Yoga Nathan, who we've interviewed here, was, is a good person to talk to in this space. And uh, hopefully, like I said, if you do decide to get a follow-up study, maybe a follow-up colonoscopy, and you've got, you know, sort of this objective evidence, if you would, if you'd, you want to share that with us, that would be wonderful. You know, you could be, uh, you know, I don't know if you've been part of our success stories. We've got hundreds upon hundreds of people with very success stories. And so anytime we have those additional objective labs, it's always uh uh, you know, a great benefit because some people don't believe you unless, you know, unless you have this or that. And, you know, I think uh, I tend to take people at their word, but anyway. All right. Well, thanks, uh, Jack. Anything else you want to share before you go? Um, no, not really. I just want to thank you, Dr. Baker, for having me on and just like know that like what you do and like what you stand for, like even when it comes to like not just hard work, but just like working out and just being a man who for sure pursues hard work. And like even just getting after the gym, the medicine ball slims and all that stuff, it's super inspirational to the younger generation. Because it's definitely something that's sort of lost with my generation. But people like you definitely renew it. And it's very inspirational. I just want to say that. Yeah, well, well, and I think thanks for that acknowledgement. And, you know, like I said, the same thing I see, uh, you know, I saw a guy, a, a picture, sort of a video of a 90-year-old guy deadlifting 405 for a double a few weeks ago, 90. And I'm like, well, damn, he's, he, you're throwing the bar down. There's no reason he can't do it when you're 90. So anyway, keep up the good work, Jack. And, you know, like I said, keep, you know, diet, exercise, sleep, take care of your health. And uh, uh, you go from, and, and you guys are wishing me happy birthday in the chat. Thank you guys. I, I'm definitely going to have a happy birthday. And you guys are, you guys are part of the reason I'm happy. So anyway, guys, take care and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye everybody. Thanks, Jack. Take yeah. Care. Thank you.